Know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here's your host, Reverend Jeff Peterson. Well, today we are studying 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this one chapter. You know, so oftentimes as we, you know, read the Bible, we think about, well, the Bible's message. But really, so much of, as we study the Bible, that we can receive that message just, for instance, in one chapter. You know, just studying one chapter of the Bible, you know, certainly can bring us to faith and life. But as we look at different chapters of the Bible, once in a while, a chapter may really stand out as being titled as something. For instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we definitely would call the love chapter. But if we go a couple more chapters down to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, then we would say that this is the resurrection chapter because the Apostle Paul is focusing specifically on the resurrection. And I'll tell you, there's so much wonderful teaching about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But we have to remember that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, like all chapters of 1 Corinthians, has to do with the Apostle Paul addressing the church of Corinth, a church that certainly was having so many problems. They were arguing and fighting over a lot of different issues, and this was dividing them to the point where it was actually threatening the very existence of the church. And that's the way that it is as people. We must always remember that a lot of times as Christians we think that, that the church has to be perfect. And a lot of times that's the judgment that the world has on the church, saying, well, look at how that church acts. Who would want to be part of the church? I mean, even the expectation, I think, of the world is that we expect the church to be perfect people. And a lot of times we may have people in the church that thinks that we are better, or that we are perfect. But no, the church, like any organization, certainly has its struggles. But not everybody sees eye to eye there's a lot of times a dissension and discord. But really, the key and the challenge to it all is not that conflict arises, but rather, how do you resolve the conflict? And that's what I would expect from the Christian church. It's not that problems will not arise, but rather, how do we deal with them when they do arise? And so... That's what the Apostle Paul is doing with the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians, is that he is addressing all the issues that this church is struggling with. And so, of all things, they're also struggling over the resurrection, that Jesus Christ is arisen from the dead. And so this, too, was a point of contention with them and that not all believed in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And so I'm just going to kind of go through here. When we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And so when we think about Christianity, when it boils right down to it, it's very simple. What is the point? It is the gospel. And gospel means good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ, who is God in human flesh, came into this world. He lived, he died, and has arisen from the dead. But it's in his dying and it is in his rising that we too have salvation. And that is the good news. That's the good news that goes forth. The good news is proclaimed like the sun. Its rays shine upon the earth. We can put up an umbrella and try to make it so that those sun rays do not hit us. But for the most part, as the sun shines, we gladly receive its rays. And, and so that's the way it is. As Jesus, as we hear the good news of Jesus, that we too, we want to receive that good news. And it's good news because that is what satisfies our soul. 
That's what satisfies our longing. It is there that we now have peace with God, peace with others, and peace uh, with ourselves. And then we celebrate this life, this life that God gives to us, knowing that we are members of the kingdom of heaven as it is here now on earth, and that our Heavenly Father is our Father who loves us. And so that's what the Apostle Paul says, that my mission to you was to proclaim the good news that you may receive it, believe it, and be God's people. That's it in a nutshell. In a nutshell. And so but part of the problem that we oftentimes have as Christians is that we lose our focus. We forget about the good news. We forget about the mission and the purpose of our gathering together. Pretty soon we start majoring in minors. We start looking at kind of incidental things. You know, things that really are what Martin Luther would call adiaphora, meaning that it really isn't all that important, but we bring what really isn't important into the forefront of who we are as uh, Christian people and that we lose sight of why it is that God has called us to be his people. And so that's what Paul is saying right off the bat, that this is the good news that I proclaim to you, that you may receive it and that you may live it and that you never want to lose sight of that. And so, if that's, and so we always have to remember to keep the main thing the main thing. <clears throat> And so he's saying that if you lose sight of the purpose for which you are called, then why are you gathering? What is it that you believe in? Then being a Christian just seems like it is something that now is in vain. And so that's the frustration when we look at Christians, if they are you know, Im embittered, and when they are in conflict and fighting, you have to ask, well, have they lost their focus? Do they remember who they are and what they are to be about? That the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that is something that we share with others. It is something that we share with the world. It is God's intention that all may come to believe that heaven's door is open to all of us that the Heavenly Father wants all of us to be his children. And so I read on now uh, to uh, verses, uh, chapter 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 3 through 8. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and at last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born." And so this is all according to the scripture, the scripture being the word of God, the Bible. Well, the scripture that, that Paul is referring to here, that has to do with, well, what we call the Old Testament. And we have to understand that God has given his word. And so as we read the Old Testament, it's not just, you know, some writings, some ancient texts, something that somebody just slopped together, but rather it is God's word. And so everything happens according to his word. You know, I think about Simeon. He was this wise man who you know, spent time in the word of God and in the temple, and God gave him a vision that the day will come when he will not die before the Christ is born. And so as Mary and Joseph came to the temple to dedicate Jesus, there Simeon took the little baby Jesus and said, Let thou thy servant depart in peace, for your word has been fulfilled. That everything has to be 
according to God's word. And if something is going that is not according to God's word, then it's not of God. And it gets really frustrating for me because I will hear Christian people say that, well, maybe the Holy Spirit is sending us in a whole different direction, in a direction that is not according to God's word. Well, when we think about the spiritual gift of discernment, of being able to discern between what is a, a true teaching, true prophecy, from what is a false prophecy or a false teaching, has to do with, is it according to God's word? And so if somebody's saying, well, you know, God now is calling us to do this, even though it contradicts the word of God. Well, you know, that's a false teaching then. And I know sometimes you can get hotshot theologians or people who are very eloquent in speech who can sway a crowd. Or pretty soon, oh, yeah, you know, so and so and so and so, and especially kind of when it goes along with, with popular uh, societal beliefs, you know, what is, I guess we call it, politically correct. Then, oh yeah, we all want to go along with this. We all want to, you know, be up to date. And after all, isn't the Bible kind of an old thing? Well, no, the Bible, God's word, it never ages. It's just as pertinent for us today as it has ever been. And that's the thing that we have to remember is that the Holy Spirit is working through the word, fulfilling all of what was written in in the law and with the prophets, with the prophecies, and then it all has come to be. And so it's something to see how our prophecies and the word and the law has all been fulfilled. And so when you think about that he used to rise, you know, I think of like Psalm 16 and in Isaiah chapter 53, that the word of God says is that the Son of God will come and he will not see death. He will not see decay, but he will be risen. He is eternal, and that's the thing that we must remember, that according to God's word, Jesus Christ is arisen from the dead. And that's why Jesus is arisen from the dead. It's according to his word, God's word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word is full of grace and truth and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that those who believe in Jesus Christ will be reborn as the children of God. Isn't that precious? That is so precious for us. It's all according to God's word. And so even Jesus, you know, Jesus is the living word. He's the word made flesh. And so he prophesied. And it's something to see how all these prophecies are now being fulfilled, even in our lifetime. And yet a few more prophecies to be fulfilled. But the main one is that Jesus Christ will come again. But Jesus being risen, it's not like just one person may, you know, saw this or that somebody just wrote this, making this all up, but that there were a lot of eyewitnesses. And it's interesting to hear about all of the people, Peter, you know, witnessed Jesus as the risen, as risen. And I think about the twelve, you know, the, the disciples of Jesus. And then there are women that we know that witnessed the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus is risen. You know, for instance, Mary Magdalene would have been one of these people. And then there was a time when Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. And so the Apostle Paul, I'm sure, could go on and on about all the people who witnessed that Jesus Christ is arisen. And so that's pretty hard now to dispute, to say that you know, all of these people, people who really didn't even know each other, somehow went to some conference and that they had to memorize, saying that this is the script. You know, why would they do that? <laughs> it would make no sense, especially when the, uh, the disciples, they all betrayed Jesus because they feared for their lives. And I could go on and on with the apologetics about all this, but the fact of it is, is that there were witnesses to Jesus being arisen from the dead. And so why do you believe anything about history? How is it that you believe that George Washington actually lived? You know, maybe this was all just a big fairy tale. I mean, after all, didn't, isn't he the one? Is it George Washington? Wasn't he the one that chopped down the cherry tree? You know, this is all just a United States fairy tale. I mean, what evidence would you have that he ever existed? 
You know, somebody were saying, no, George Washington existed, and we would all just kind of break out in a roar of laughter. How can you be so gullible to believe that somebody like this actually lived? Why? Well, there's evidence from the standpoint that we can see where he lived. We can go to Mount Vernon. You know, that there were people who witnessed him. <laughs> that's a big one, that people witnessed him. And they say that, no, what he wrote here, that's actually his writings. And so pretty soon, even though I never have seen George Washington, based on witnesses and testimonies and writings and archaeological evidence to say, you know, he existed. I really believe that he did. Well, what's the difference? I mean, Jesus is the same thing. But to me, the whole key is, is when the Holy Spirit comes to your, into dwell in your heart, and he's convicting you that Jesus Christ is arisen because you can experience his risen presence and his risen power. And so you can say, well, you know what? <clears throat> yeah, I believe all of this, you know, all these people who witness Jesus, but you can add another person onto the list, and, and, and that's Jeff Peterson. He can give you a testimony that Jesus Christ is arisen from the dead. And so that's the whole key, is at what point do we add your name to the list? Well, you are now a witness, one who bears the testimony of Jesus. And one of the things is that Paul says, but I'm the least of the apostles. Now, Paul didn't know Jesus while, he, while Jesus was living his life in this world. He came to believe after the resurrection, as he was on his way to Damascus, as he was along the road, it was there that, that the risen Jesus met him on the road. And he struck Paul down to his knees. And scales came over his eyes to where he couldn't see. And that's where he came to believe. That's where he came to encounter and to see the risen Jesus. And so an apostle is somebody who, literally, in the Greek, it means somebody who is, who is sent. And so the apostle Paul, so we always say that the apostles that were close to Jesus, that one of the requirements was is that they actually saw the risen Jesus, that they encountered Jesus, that they got to know Jesus. But what is so interesting is that as well as we study the lives of Jesus' followers in their backgrounds, is that a lot of them had you know, a transformation in their lives. Mary Magdalene would have been one of these people. Zacchaeus, Matthew, where we see lives that are radically transformed. But now we know that there was opposition to Jesus. Now, a lot of people say that Jesus was just a nice man. Well, if Jesus was just a nice man, well, then everybody would like him. Nobody would have a problem with him if he were just a nice man doing good things. I mean, do you have a problem with a nice man or a nice woman in your neighborhood? At your workplace? Out on the highway? Or wherever it may be, in an organization, in a club that you belong to? Or when you go bowling? Well, one of the people on my team is a nice person. Well, do you have a problem with that? Nobody has a problem with a nice person. If somebody comes and shows kindness to us in a day, we won't have a problem with that. We don't even care what religion they are, if they even have a religion. Well, this is a nice person. We want them in our neighborhood. I can't hold anything against a nice person. And I hear that argument. Well, Jesus was a nice person doing good things. Well, then why did he end up on a cross? Because he's more than a nice person. He is God. And we have to understand that with God, there is animosity, there's enmity toward God. It's kind of like a poisonous snake that is stalking a rodent. That snake wants the rodent, and it's going to continue until it gets it. And that's the way the devil is, is that the devil is slithering around 
like a poisonous snake trying to bite anybody who has any, well, first of all, you know, trying to get rid of God, trying to do Jesus in. And the thing of it is, is that when humanity fell with the temptation of Satan, Our human nature is at en enmity with God. And that's the thing that we must remember. Is that humanity does not have a problem with a nice person. We will revere that person. We, and if that person does enough good in, in their lives around the world, well, they will be forever in our history books. When you look at Gandhi, he wasn't a Christian. My understanding is that he was a Hindu, but he was a good person. We all like a guy like this. How can anybody say anything against him? And so if Jesus just simply was a good guy, then we just look at him as being Gandhi. He was a wonderful man. We need more people like that in the history of our world. Well, no, because he's God, humanity's going to take him down. The devil's going to take him down. And so that enmity was in, the, was in Paul. Matter of fact, his name before he was Paul was Saul. And so he's saying that I'm the least of the, the apostles. I'm the last one now to be the apostle because I was out arresting and persecuting Christians. I mean, I was on the other side of the team. When you think about it, have you ever been on a sports team before and you know who your most bitter rival is? And you go from being on this team to now being on your most bitter rivalry team? I mean, that's what this is like. When you were on this team and you know this team and you just despise them, you hate every cell of their bodies. Matter of fact, just, just when you see them, I mean, you, you kind of get this smell. It's just like, ugh. Well, that was Saul. He couldn't stand Christians. And he was trying to get rid of this whole movement called now the way. And so what a transformation that he had. I mean, once again, talking about apologetics, it's somebody who was the most bitter rival to Christians, now is a Christian to the point where, well, to the point where it was hard for them to actually, you know, they didn't trust Paul at first. They just thought, you know, this was all kind of a setup so that he could arrest and kill more Christians. But Paul became a Christian, and so he too, what a strong witness that he is to Christianity. Not only that he became a Christian, and that his life was transformed so radically to where God changed his name from Saul to Paul, that he did such a ministry. I mean, he planted churches throughout the whole uh, Roman world throughout the whole Mediterranean area. And not only did he plant these churches, but in many cases he would go back to visit these churches and, he'd do, and he would write letters like 1 Corinthians to the church of Corinth. So he's writing letters. He was corresponding with these churches. And so he's truly, you know, making his, the evidence to say, well, who do you think that I am? A person whose life has been radically transformed by Jesus. And if it wasn't for Jesus and his resurrection, I wouldn't be who I am today. And so that's why Apostle Paul is saying, well then, you know, if, it, <laughs> why are you a Christian if you don't believe in Jesus? Your faith is in vain. Okay, well then, uh, chapter 15, uh, verses 9 through 11 he says, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. And so here again, I just talked about that, where the Apostle Paul says, I'm not worthy to be a follower of Jesus, to be a member of the church of God. But he talks about, but it's not me, but it's the grace of God that 
In other words, it's the Holy Spirit working within me that's transforming my life from the inside out. To see that there is a radical change in his life. There were once he had a passion to get rid of Christianity. Now he has a passion to, to be a Christian, to follow in the ways of God according to his word, having that passion to spread the good news of the gospel. That was his whole life. I mean, that was his life. I know as a pastor, a lot of people will say, well, well, Jeff, you know, you need to take more time off. Or sometimes we hear pastors more and more saying, well, the church just demands too much of me or I get overworked. Well, here again, you know, God is certainly one that wants us to take time off. I mean, after all, God rested on the seventh day. But if, it's not, if we're not about being a Christian, then what is it that we are about? Is it like we are a Christian, I don't know, 45% of the time, and then the other 55% of the time we are somebody else? Well, we work, you know, we're called into the ministry and we want to be part of the ministry and doing God's work all the time. Why? Because that's our passion. The Holy Spirit is shut up in our bones. We want to do as much as we can to serve the Lord in our lives. So that's why. Pastor, you're working, you're at the church all the time. Well, what a lot of people call work, I call, well, what a lot of people call work, I call fun, but but no, we work long hours because we truly love what we're doing. This is our calling. This is our passion. To know Christ and to make Christ known. Yeah, I've had a lot of interests in life. You know, I've been interested in athletics. I've been interested in the outdoors. I'm interested in model railroading as an example. And not to say that I don't do these things anymore. But all that stuff is so secondary. What's most important is my relationship with God. That's the fulfillment of life. You know, you can run and get medals and trophies and awards and recognitions, but what is that in relationship to having that special relationship of our Lord Jesus Christ? And, and that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, that this is my life. Jesus is my passion. And that is what I'm all about. And so we don't, so that's what he preaches, that's what he lives, that's what he's trying to convince others, to know that our faith is not in vain. You have been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson, pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $25 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, God is Spirit. Thank you for watching and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.